Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to our training today on the cost principles and how to develop your budget for your application. My name is Suhaila Lasky and I'm a financial grants analyst with the Office on Violence Against Women in the Grants Financial Management Division. I've been doing this for about the past nine years, eight of which have been with OVW. Our goal with this presentation is to help you as an applicant to create your budget and provide an understanding of the things you should be thinking of when determining what costs to include and where to put them. We want to help reduce any challenges you may face with the budget and make it clear what we look for when we review your budget. So I'll also provide some insight as to what OVW financial staff considers during our review. One thing that'll be really helpful for this training is if you have out the sample budget detail worksheet that we have available on our website. Throughout the presentation, we'll use examples taken straight out of that document. So going through it as we discuss each cost category will really help maximize this training for you. Just like with any other training, we have to start off with the basics. And that starts with understanding how to treat the cost that you can include in the budget. In the uniform guidance, there's a section on cost principles, and they set the federal government's expectations for the recipient standards for administering federal funds. So what type of standards do we have for your, your costs and why is this important? When you're creating your budget, each and every cost or line item in the budget should be allowable, reasonable, and necessary to the project. For this discussion, we'll use the purchase of a laptop for an advocate as an example and go through each of these bullet points and how they're relevant. First, is a cost allowable with all federal and state regulations, with a program solicitation, with your internal policies, and any other legal authority that you'd need to follow? So for the example with the advocate's laptop, the cost may be allowable in the uniform guidance, but may not be based on the program solicitation. So you need to consider all regulations and policies for the allowability of a cost. Next, is the cost reasonable? We perform what's called a prudent person test, where we ask ourselves, would a prudent person say, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable cost for that item? For our advocate's laptop, is the cost $5,000 and used by scientists over at NASA to send astronauts to outer space? Or is it a reasonable cost at like $800 and perfect for the staff's position to perform their daily duties? And then, is the cost necessary? Based on the project and the activities that are performed by the advocate, is a laptop necessary for their work? This is why the narrative section for each line item is so important, because in the narrative, you have the chance to justify and support the need for the cost. Also, if the advocate in our example isn't projecting to spend all of their time on the project, then you'd have to prorate that cost and allocate it by the percentage of time they will spend on the proposed grant. And last, all costs should be treated consistently, whether they're funded by federal or non-federal funds and in accordance with your organization's policies and procedures. For example, you should have one travel policy that covers staff travel that doesn't vary depending on if it's for your grant or other non-federally funded travel activities. It should be the same across the board, and you'll hear me mention that a lot throughout this training because we get a lot of questions about this for different types of costs. So these are the things that you should consider when creating your budget because they're the exact things that we think about when we review. Okay, so now that we went over the standards for determining the costs, we're going to move on to classifying your costs and go through each of the cost categories in the budget. The very first thing you want to consider is whether any cost you put in your budget is a direct or 
indirect costs. But what does that mean? So direct costs are all of those costs that are related specifically to your project or activity, and you can easily identify them as such with a high degree of accuracy. So this would include your staff who work directly on the grant and their percentage of time for the project, their related fringe costs, their travel costs for the project, their program supplies, your partner's costs, and anything else directly related to the project. On the other hand, there are indirect costs, and these are much harder to assign to a specific project or activity and benefit common purposes or more than one activity for your organization. Examples of these would include the time spent for human resource or finance activities, for staff who cannot directly track their time to one specific funding source or activity because it benefits everyone or the entire organization. So first, we're going to go through each of the direct cost categories as you see listed here, and then we'll discuss the indirect cost category. And remember, pull out that sample budget worksheet so we can go through it while we go through the training. First is the personnel category. And this includes the compensation you pay to staff working directly on the project. This is for the recipient staff only, not your project partners and not a contractor or consultant, just your direct staff. You want to make sure you have a full breakdown of costs listed for each position and their projected time for activities related directly to the project. The breakdown should include the salary or hourly base, the percentage of time or total hours, and the total years or months, which should be equal to the length of the project period stated in the program solicitation. Below the cost breakdowns, include a narrative for each of the positions listed in the section. It should include a description of the activities that each position will perform for the award. In the example you see at the bottom of the slide, which we pulled from the sample budget, are the costs for the program coordinator listed in the personnel category. As you can see, the base salary is listed here at 47,000 per year, and the applicant projects that they'll spend 50% of their time on the award for a total of three years. And below that is the narrative that clearly describes their anticipated activities they'll perform. Two of the most common mistakes we see in this category are that the applicants do not include a full breakdown of the cost and they do not include a narrative for all of the positions listed above it. So make sure that everyone is included and don't forget to triple check those calculations. Continuing through the cost categories, next we have fringe benefits, and these costs should correspond directly with the staff costs from the personnel category. There's sometimes confusion as to what can be budgeted here for fringe benefits, like can you only charge the bare minimum types of costs? So to clarify, the basic principles for fringe benefits is that the amount you budget should be related to each staff person's percentage of time on the grant and that the benefits are consistently applied regardless of the funding source. So you would include the same benefits under this award as you would for non-federal funded work and follow your organization's policy for fringe benefits. And the portion of fringe that you charge should be equal to the portion of time allocated by that staff member in the personnel category. You can see how that applies in the example at the bottom of the slide under health insurance. The program coordinator, if we remember from personnel, projects their time at 50% in the budget. So here in fringe, we will budget their cost for health insurance at 50% as well. The other fringe cost in this example are all set percentages like FICA at 7.65% and calculated against their total cost in the budget. So you would show the calculation in this section for each of the different fringe rates that your staff incurs. And last on this topic, 
Some of the questions we get are about the cost of living increases or merit increases and whether or not they're allowable. Those should be based on an organizational policy and applicable across the organization. So not just for positions funded with federal grant dollars. So if it's something that you normally provide for all staff in accordance with your internal policies, then you can include it in the budget as well. The travel category is for travel costs incurred by the applicant's direct staff. If you want to budget any travel costs for your consultants or your partners, those go to the consultants, contracts, and subawards category. Any other travel for clients or victims or for attendees should be allocated in the other category. All travel costs should be broken down with a supporting narrative and follow your organization's document to travel policy. Some organizations use the GSA tra federal travel regulations, and that's fine too. Uh, just remember that all travel costs should be consistent across the board and should not vary depending on the funding source. We have some examples of costs that can be included in this category and how they should be broken down. First listed here is the required travel allocation that you will find in your program solicitation for OVW mandated training and technical assistance. You have to make sure that you label it as such so that when we review your budget, we can easily identify it and know that you're correctly budgeting for the required amount. Each program varies with the required total for this purpose, so make sure to check your solicitation for the amount to include in your budget. The other example we have here is for local program mileage. This is a cost that might be included if the program staff anticipate traveling locally for pr project purposes, like to travel between the program shelter, main office, partner organizations, and use his or her own vehicle which, by the way, is exactly what you would describe in the narrative. And as you can see, the computation estimates 150 miles per month at a reimbursement rate of 0.545 cents per mile for the life of the project. So make sure to show the computation and then in the narrative, describe the purpose for the cost. The most common mistakes we find here are a lack of breakdown of costs, missing narrative descriptions, calculation errors, and costs included in this category that are not for direct applicant staff. Moving on to equipment, you'll use this category for non-expendable tangible property with more than a year's useful life. And unless your organization's capitalization threshold is lower than the federal threshold, equipment items should have a fair market value of $5,000 or more. Check your internal policies if you're not sure what your capitalization threshold is, because as I mentioned, it may be lower, like in the example we have here. If you need to budget for equipment items that are rented or leased, they should be budgeted with contracts. And last on here, as with every other cost in the budget, make sure to show your calculation breakdown of the cost and that it is supported with a narrative. Our example here shows the cost for two video cameras at $1,500 each, and the narrative provides the justification that describes the purpose and the need for the cameras. You'll also notice that in this example, the applicant's capitalization threshold is $1,000, which is why the cameras at $1,500 each are in this category. So to recap for this category, make sure you focus on your calculations, include a narrative for each line item, only include costs that meet your capitalization threshold, and only include costs that are for the purchase of equipment and not a rental. Now, unlike the equipment items, the supplies category is for materials that are expendable and consumable. Items in this category may include general office supplies, copy paper, training materials, postage, brochures, program supplies, and plenty of other types of costs. And all costs should be broken down and supported with the narrative. 
Now, when you're putting your budget together, you'll include estimates for these costs, since it's not always known how much you'll need. And then for any shared costs, like general office supplies, include the allocation method that equitably distributes the cost. We have provided detailed guidance for our OVW recipients on allocating costs. So please take a look at the cost allocation guidance document and the sample budget, both found on our website, before putting your budget together. The basic premise for this is that in order to include costs that are shared amongst office staff or used by someone for more than one project, there needs to be a system in place to share the cost in an equitable way. The guidance I just referenced will provide that for you. So please review it and make sure you apply it in your budget appropriately. And last, here we have an update with the uniform guidance from 2015. And that is that any computing device can be considered a supply item instead of an equipment item as long as the cost is below your capitalization threshold. Or if you don't have one, then the federal threshold, which we mentioned before, was $5,000. In our example at the bottom of the slide, you'll see there are a couple different types of costs that we want to emphasize. First is for general office supplies. And like I mentioned, you can estimate the monthly cost. And then if it's a shared cost like this is, include the allocation percentage. And the narrative is where you'll include the computation that you use to get that percentage which is shown in the sample budget worksheet. Next, we have program supplies, and this cost is still estimated, but you can see there isn't an allocation computed against it. That's because this is for a direct supply cost that is used solely for the program and not a shared cost, so the cost is not allocated. And last is another direct program cost for victim assistance kits which is also fully budgeted and not allocated since it's used directly for the project. So to highlight the most common errors we find in this category, make sure to break down all costs, support each line item with a narrative, and most importantly, if you have shared costs, make sure your budget describes the allocation method that distributes the cost and that you show your computation used to get the percentage in the narrative. Go to our website and review the guidance. Trust me, you'll be so glad you didn't. So we're going to move on to some material that is a little heavier than what we've discussed so far as we go through the consultants, contracts, and subawards category. This part of the training is a bit more complex, but when not followed properly, can leave organizations open to audit findings, which is of course something we wanna avoid. So this category is where you'll budget any contracts you have for goods or services, including your consultant costs. And also here is where you'll include any sub awards that you issue, like you would with your MOU partners. But where the complex part in all of this comes into play is when you're making the determination if that organization's services that they're providing for your project fall under a contract or a subaward. We'll go through some slides that describe the characteristics of each, but it's important to first understand that the substance of the relationship you have with the organization and the nature of the services that they provide is more important than the name of the agreement. So what that means is you can call everything a contract, but when you issue a, an agreement that is more closely aligned with a subaward, you still have to follow all of the requirements for administering and monitoring subawards. So it still would need to be treated like a subaward, regardless of what you call it. We're placing a greater emphasis on this topic because we see far too often that subawards are being treated like contracts and their costs are being broken down in the budget like contracts and not subawards. We're going to start off by going through the characteristics of contracts and subawards. Then we'll go through the requirements that you'll need to follow if you're awarded when issuing either agreement type.
But one thing that I want to go over before we begin is that we get a lot of questions from applicants who are trying to figure out if their agreement in the budget is for a contract or subaward because they find that they fall in a gray area where they have characteristics for each, and that might happen. So what we recommend doing is developing an internal process where you document your review of the characteristics when you determine if the agreement is a contract or a subaward, so that if you're asked about it in the future, you have documentation that supports the decision you made and the reasons for it. But you'll have to use your best judgment. And like I said, document your decision-making process and maintain it internally on file. Again, this is important because subawards and contracts each carry different requirements that you'll need to follow if you're awarded, so you want to make sure you're following the right requirements. First, we'll start off with contractors who normally operate in a competitive environment. They provide goods and services within their normal, normal business operations to many different purchasers, and the goods and services are generally ancillary to the operation of the federal program. The main purpose of contracting with them is to obtain goods and services for your own use or benefit. You typically would not have them comply with federal requirements as a result of the agreement, although similar requirements may apply for other reasons. Some examples of services that are generally contracts include hiring a web designer to update your website for the project or an auditor who performs the single audit for your organization. And take note, at the bottom of the slide, we reference where you can get more information on all of this in the uniform guidance if you just look up 2 CFR Part 200.330. If you determine that the nature of the agreement does in fact most closely align with a contract, then you'd also need to make sure that you're following your procurement policies if you're awarded. This should allow for free and open competition and follow your procurement policies and procedures. Noted here at the bottom of the screen are the procurement standards from the uniform guidance, so please reference these if you have any questions about procurement. The rate that the contractor is compensated should be reasonable and consistent with rates they've received in the past for providing similar services in the marketplace. Now, something we have to discuss is that we hear all the time, and we see in budgets all the time, that there is a standard federal or OVW rate for consultants of $650 per day. Please understand, this doesn't exist and is commonly confused with the threshold that we have. So to clarify, if a consultant's rate is expected to exceed $650 per day for an eight-hour day, or $81.25 per hour, then that grantee must first obtain prior approval for that rate before entering into any contract. So there is no standard rate you should pay a consultant, and each consultant's rate should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis for reasonableness and consistency with market rates and should not be $650 per day across the board. The last note here for contracts is that any sole source contract, which is a non-competitive contract that exceeds $250,000, must obtain prior approval before entering into any agreement. Next, we have the list of characteristics for subrecipients. Generally, subawards are issued when federal funds are used to carry out a program for a public purpose, as opposed to just providing goods and services for the benefit of your organization. Their performance is measured against the program objectives, and they often report to you with their progress, so you can include their stats in your reports, like if they also serve victims, you would include those figures in your progress report. 
Subrecipients also need to adhere to the program requirements. So if you have special terms and conditions on your award, you would pass those through to the subrecipient as well. They can also at times determine who's eligible to receive assistance or services with program funds and sometimes have the responsibility for programmatic decision making. An example here would be if as part of your project, you identify and partner with another local nonprofit organization who hires an advocate as part of your awards project to serve victims in the area where they're located. They're also included as one of your MOU partners and you reimburse them for the advocate's salary, fringe, travel, supplies, and other costs they incur that are directly related to the project. They report to you regularly on their progress and they also follow the same rules you follow when carrying out their part of the award. This is an instance where you'd issue a subaward. Now, if after going through the list of characteristics, you determine that the agreement most closely aligns with a subaward, then you must ensure that if you're awarded, that you're properly administering and monitoring these agreements. There's an entire section in the uniform guidance that goes through the requirements that a direct recipient, as the pass-through entity who is issuing the subaward would be called, uh, would need to follow. But we listed out a few important ones here that we'll go through real quick. First, you'll need to clearly identify the agreement as a subaward and include all of the required information which is listed in 2 CFR 200.331, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Uh, there's a long list of elements that must be included on the subaward document, so make sure to go through this section before issuing a subaward. Next, you need to make sure that the subrecipient doesn't pose any potential risk if they receive funding and can comply with the same federal rules and regulations that your organization needs to follow for the award uh, if, if you subaward them. If you recall, part of the application you're filling out right now requires that you complete a pre-award risk assessment and answer some questions on your financial accounting practices. This, along with other reviews we perform, is all part of OVW's assessment of an applicant's potential risk and something that you would need to review and document as well for your subrecipients. Again, take a look at this section of the Uniform Guidance for more factors that should be considered when evaluating potential risk of a subrecipient. Additionally, you'll need to monitor the subrecipient's activities and have a policy in place that documents your subaward monitoring process. Things you should review include, but aren't limited to, reviewing their financial and performance reports that you have your subrecipients complete, making sure that they're following all federal regulations and any terms and conditions of the subaward, and reviewing their audits and making sure they're taking the appropriate actions if there are any findings with their ability to administer the subaward. If you find that there are any areas that could potentially pose a risk or any deficiencies with their ability to administer the subaward, it's your responsibility to take action and use the tools you have available to ensure compliance. This can include required training and technical assistance, performing on-site reviews of their operations, or imposing special conditions to their subaward. So we went over the characteristics for contracts and consultants and subawards. But we also want to go over how you would demonstrate these costs in your budget. So first, let's start off with the example for consultants. Here, we have a trainer who will provide sexual assault training and listed in the budget is their daily rate of $575 for eight hours of work for three days. Like we discussed previously, that rate was determined on an individual basis. And the consultant demonstrated that this rate is consistent with what they normally charge for this service in the marketplace. And if awarded, the recipient's procurement procedures would have been used before contracting these services. 
Also, since the rate does not exceed $650 per day, if this applicant is awarded, they will not need to come in for prior approval because it does not exceed the threshold for the consultant rates. The other way that you can demonstrate the consultant's cost is by using their hourly rate if they don't expect to work a full eight-hour day. And in that case, you just break down the cost by their hourly rate times the total hours of service. And one last thing to note is a reminder that you do not break down costs for or treat your MLU partners like consultants or contracts. We'll go over how to break down their costs in the last example on the slide for subawards. And now moving on in the next example, we have various types of contracts listed with their breakdowns in the budget. The first is a therapist whose rate is $50 per hour and projected at 20 hours per month. This rate should be consistent with their normal fee for service. And if you're awarded, you use your procurement procedures to contract for these services. Next is a cell phone contract that's charged at 100% so the staff person who uses the phone should also be listed in the budget at 100% of their time. And last is a contract for the lease of a copier and printer. As you can see here, the cost is prorated based on your organization's allocation method because it is shared by all staff in the office. And in the narrative, make sure to include how you determine the allocation rate. Remember to visit our website for the cost allocation guidance for more information on this. The last example here is for subawards. As you can see, the way they break down their costs is very different from the examples above it. Since a subrecipient or your MOU partner is not making a profit from this service, nor do they charge in a fee for service manner, they'll break down their costs just like you did throughout the rest of the budget. So for each subaward or MOU partner, you'll list out their costs that they anticipate incurring as a result of their participation on the project. In the example here, we have XYZ Victim Services Organization, and the budget starts off with their compensation for the advocate's time by listing their annual salary, percentage of time on the subaward, and the total years of their subaward. Next is the cost for their fringe benefits. And last is their cost for travel. And in this example, they plan to attend the required OVW training and technic technical assistance events. I mentioned earlier in the travel category how important it is to use the correct title for the travel requirement. And that's because when we review the budget, we add up all the costs that are identified for this purpose to make sure the applicant has budgeted the correct amount of funds, which are based on the program solicitation requirement. Any other costs that the subrecipient anticipates incurring related to their work on the project should be included in this same section. And you would break them down using the same principles applied to how your costs need to be detailed in the budget. From a budget creation perspective, the main takeaway with these examples is that applicants need to think carefully and thoughtfully how they issue agreements with other organizations or vendors, and that the budget reflects the breakdown associated with the appropriate agreement type, whether it's a contract or subaward. Far too often do we see MOU partner costs broken down like consultants and contracts, when in fact it should be a subaward. So please make sure to go through the section of the training as many times as you need to or review the uniform guidance in the sections that I referenced to make sure you have an understanding of these principles and your budget reflects a breakdown of costs consistent with the appropriate agreement type. This is the last slide on the topic of subrecipients and contractors, and we just want to recap some of the more important aspects of each agreement type and the requirements that follow with each of them. For example, first we have MOU partners are generally considered this, and the chart identifies MOU partners as generally subrecipients. Next, do procurement standards, including competition and sole source approval, apply? And the answer is that only contracts trigger the requirement that you would follow for your procurement standards, and they come into OVW for sole source approval if it exceeds the threshold. 
subawards do not trigger procurement standards and requirements. And this is one of the biggest distinctions between the requirements for contracts and subawards. We'll skip down to the bottom too. Uh, profit may be earned, and this applies to contractors who generally operate in a competitive fee-for-service environment and make a profit as part of their business model. That web designer you contract with is going to include in their rate room for earning profit. That's just their business model. On the other hand, recipients are reimbursed for actual costs incurred, as you can see on this chart. And you budget for their costs just like you would your own costs throughout the rest of the budget. You list out their staff, salary, percentage of time in the project, their fringe benefits, travel costs are broken down, so forth. So they're not making any profit here. You're just reimbursing them for their actual direct costs that they're incurring to participate on the project. So make sure to refer to the Uniform Guidance for additional clarification on this topic, as it provides much more detail than we have time to cover in this presentation. So let's get back to the budget categories and continue through to the other cost category. A lot of what goes on in this category are costs that don't fall under the other more specific categories that we already went through. Some examples of costs that go here include rent for office space for your staff, registration fees for training events, client and survivor assistance costs like transportation and other types of participant support costs. The cost listed in this category can use estimates if you don't know the exact monthly cost or if it goes up and down each month. Just use historical data to estimate the figure. And if there are any costs that are shared, like we discussed previously with general office supplies, then those costs should be allocated using your cost allocation method and then should be demonstrated in both the calculation and the narrative for the line item. All costs must be broken down to show the calculation of how you determine the total cost and supported by a narrative that describes and justifies the need for it. One question we get sometimes from applicants who own their office or facility is whether or not they can charge that cost because it's not rented from an outside source. The answer is that yes, you can charge a proportionate or allocated amount of the cost of ownership, which can include insurance, maintenance, depreciation, and other similar types of costs, but you cannot charge mortgage or interest. And you would break down all these costs in the budget and narrative just like you would any other cost. In our budget example here, we have the cost for bus vouchers for victims when attending therapy sessions or receiving other direct services and are estimated at $15 per voucher. The important thing to take away from this line item example is that in your narrative, you should describe for any voucher or gift card the internal controls that you have in place to ensure their proper maintenance, inventory, and distribution. Are they kept in a locked box? How often are they inventoried and by whom? When they're distributed, are they required to be sound, signed out by a specific staff person or two? And what is the oversight of the process? Are these processes all documented in your internal policies and procedures? All of this should be described in the narrative because that's what we look for in the review process. So be proactive and included in the budget. The next cost in this example is for a crisis hotline. And since it's a direct cost of the program, it's charged directly in this budget. And last year is rent. But in the narrative, it is described as the rental cost for a rented house for a transitional housing program, and it's used solely for the purpose of the program. So this example does not allocate the cost in this case because it is a direct cost, and it's not for, for example, um, your staff office space. So to highlight the most important things to remember with this category is to break down all costs Include a narrative for all line items to describe and justify the cost. All shared costs are allocated and the allocation method is described in the narrative. And any vouchers or gift cards, if they're allowed by the program, include a description in the narrative of the documented internal controls you have in place. Now that we've finished going through all of the direct costs, 
we want to briefly go through the indirect costs section. As previously described, indirect costs are those that cannot be readily identifiable to a specific cost objective, and they tend to benefit more than one activity. Some examples include costs for operating and maintaining facilities, general administrative, and plenty of others. For example, let's say you have finance staff and they process all of the payroll, invoices, financial statements, and everything else financial related for the organization. Because all of their activities benefit the entire organization and cannot be easily tracked to one specific funding source, their time, fringe, and any other related overhead costs should all be included as indirect costs and not charged directly. Now, there are only two ways that you can include costs in this category. The first is by having a current federally negotiated indirect cost rate agreement. Take note of my reference to the agreement being current. Far too often do we review budgets that have agreements that are expired. The range of time that the rate agreement covers is listed on the document itself. Also, make sure to actually attach the agreement with your application package. I see a lot of times applicants will submit multiple applications across different programs for a funding year, and only one applicant, excuse me, one, only one application will actually have the rate agreement. Please help everyone save time and make sure to submit the current agreement document with each of the applications you submit. The second way you can recover indirect costs is by using the de minimis rate, which is where you calculate 10% of modified total direct costs. There's an entire section in the uniform guidance referenced at the bottom of the slide in 2 CFR part 200.414 that goes over who can use the de minimis rate and how to apply it. So make sure to like take a look if you plan on using it. We have two examples here for recovering indirect costs in the budget. The first is for applicants who have an approved rate agreement with their cognizant agency. So in this example, the rate is 32% with a base of direct salaries, excluding fringe benefits. And from our sample budget worksheet, the total for just salaries from personnel came to $212,700. So the applicant here multiplies the total salaries against the indirect cost rate of 32% for a total of $68,064 for indirect costs. Also note the narrative where the applicant indicates that they are using their approved rate agreement that is current and attached to the application package. Now there are plenty of ways for an indirect cost rate to be computed, especially with the base. As you see in this example, the base to which the rate is computed is total salaries. But there are other bases like salaries plus fringe or modified total direct costs. You have to make sure you're following exactly what your rate agreement says for the base when you're calculating this part of your budget. The second example is for the de minimis rate. If you elect to use the de minimis rate, then indicate that in the budget clearly. Really often I see applicants just write 10% indirect costs and not even indicate that they're using the de minimis rate. You have to tell us that that's what you're using. Also, what's really helpful and will reduce a lot of guesswork for additional questions on our part is if you include in the narrative the breakdown for how you came up with the total for modified total direct costs. The definition for modified total direct costs can be found in the uniform guidance, so make sure you review it so you know exactly what can and cannot be included in this space. And show us your calculation for you how you came up with that total. So to wrap everything up, we listed out some of the most common errors we encounter that we wanted to highlight for you. So please remember, all costs require a breakdown that show the calculation for how you determine the total. All shared costs should be allocated with the allocation method and computation described in the narrative. And speaking of narrative, 
Every cost in the budget should have a corresponding narrative description of the cost and justification of why it's necessary. Please only use the federal cost categories that we just went through and don't make up any new ones. If you have any questions about a cost category and you're not sure where it goes, feel free to contact our help desk with your questions. Uh, the total project time that you budget should be equal to the total time listed in the solicitation. If the program solicitation says that the projects are for 36 months, then make sure that you're budgeting for a full 36 months worth of activity. And last, and I cannot emphasize this enough, triple check your calculations. It is one of the easiest parts of creating a budget. And I can't tell you how often we review budgets with simple calculation errors. Have someone else check all the calculations for you if you think that would help. But it really helps move things along quickly on our end when calculations are accurate and it makes for a nice clean budget. So I really hope that this training was able to provide some insight on how to create your OVW budget and give you some guidance on the things we see most often that we have questions about. So good luck with your application and keep doing great work.